All about Jesus, it certainly is. We sang Little Town of Bethlehem, and so that's where we start today. In the book of Micah, chapter 5, in verse 2 it says, And thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousand of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me that is to be ruler of Israel, whose going forth have been from old, from everlasting. By Bethlehem. Now, Phillips Brooks was a minister in England probably 160, 80 years ago. Made a trip to Palestine, was very impressed with it. Came home, and one time in December, he said, I want to make a new song for our church to sing. So he wrote a poem. Now, if you notice, we sang that song in our book. Philip Brooks is at the bottom of that page as the author of the words. But he didn't know music all that well, so he gave it to his organ director and asked that he would put a tune to his words. Well, the organ director was kind of busy. He did a lot of other things, and I guess you might have said why he's busy, because he took a group of 10 Sunday school boys and turned them into a class of 1,000. That's, that's pretty good sized class. Now, Sunday school back in that day was a little bit different because Sunday school was not only about the Bible, but they taught kids how to read and write because kids back in his day went to factories to work. There were no child labor laws, and so the only day they had off from work from the factory was on Sunday, and they called out of mayhem. The church was trying to gather them together to teach them something because they couldn't go to school otherwise because they were poor. Anyway, he kind of forgot about it, the director did. And on the way to church, he got to thinking about that song, and in his head popped the tune. And that's how the tune came together, and old little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Phyllis Brooks was quite an individual, and a lot of people really thought a lot of him. Never married. He loved all the children that were around him, and when he died, one little girl said, oh, how happy they're going to be in heaven when Mr. Brooks is, is going to be there. So they had a lot of feeling for him. Bethlehem. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, it says. Well, how big is it? How little was it? Well, when we think back, I don't know they have exact population count, but the thought is that in Jesus' day, the town of Bethlehem would be like two Moulton's. Around a thousand or less. It was a little town. Can you see why Jesus had a hard time, or his parents had a hard time finding a motel room? How many motel rooms you know there are in Moulton available? Well, there's not, not too many. And so Bethlehem has grown through the history of time. It has, of course, the same history that the rest of Palestine had. Eventually, it became under Palestinian control, and when they gave Israel back their land, it was not part of Israel. It was part of Palestine. The Palestinians owned it. In 1967, they had a big war, and Israel won five different battles on different fronts, and Bethlehem became their city again, so it was now under control of Israel. Well, in 2005, they gave it back to the Palestinians, and so they control it, but they put a three-walled cement barrier around Bethlehem. And there's only one way in and out, and one way back and forth, and is heavily policed, and so Bethlehem is kind of part of the problem over there. 25,000 people or so, like a tumble about, live in Bethlehem today. Well, what did they have? What do we have about the birth of Christ? Well, according to the earliest records we have, we believe Jesus was born not in a Iowa manger, manger made out of wood, but rather where they kept animals kind of underground in a small cave. That seemed to be the most likely thing from what we can find in history. And of course, people went as early as two and 300 AD and began to mark the spots where things happened. And Queen Helena went down there and she found this is the birthplace of Jesus and they put a silver star there. It's kind of like going down into a basement. They built a big building over it. Well, part of the problem the building was that people would ride in on their horses and have a church and they'd ride in on their horses and cause mayhem. So they took the door and made it about half the size of a door so a horse couldn't get through. And if you went through, you kind of had to go like that. If you had lumbago, you might have a problem going to church in the church of the nativity. But you go down into the basement still yet, and there is a silver star. Well, they replaced the one that somebody stole some hundred or two years ago. And so they always got a policeman there. Isn't that funny? I have a policeman guarding the birthplace of Christ. Uh, that's the way it is. Old little town of Bethlehem is what it was. But... As far as God was concerned, he wasn't concerned, I don't know, about the amount of population and the history. But he told us a couple of things about that place we need to know. 
Again, I remind you that before there was a world, God had planned to send Jesus. Why would it be that God would make a world and put people in it and they would sin and reject him and, and be mean to one another and he would keep doing that anyway and then send his son to be the Savior so that they could have a new chance? Why would God bother all of that? I don't know that I can answer that question except God's a God of love. And I guess when you think about it, you want people to love you, don't you? You want people to just love you because they have to or act like they do because they have to? You're very, very rich, and so they all just kind of bow down to you because you've got money. Is that satisfying? I wouldn't think so. You can buy a robot. You can buy and talk to, uh, hey, Google, if you want to, but does Google love you? You ever ask, Google, do you love me? Hey, well, I, I don't think that would be too satisfying. Me and Google, we love each other. Well, you, you want somebody that chooses you, and that's what God has done. Angels were made, and... Hey, serve God. I mean, why wouldn't you? But here are human beings who have a choice. You can choose not to. You can choose to do so. And God has taken the risk that he wants you to love him. Now, when he loves you and you love him, you have blessings that you have no other way. And so we understand the blessing that he has there. So I think God made all this for a particular reason. And through the Bible, we have it told to us that God so loved this world that he gave his son. I guess that's good enough as a reason. I want you to think of two things, though, about Bethlehem. One, it was little. Now, God had the choice of the world. He could have had a son born in Rome or in Egypt, which was then a great culture center. He had been born in Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem is only about five miles from Bethlehem. It's the big city. But Bethlehem sits on a mountain as well, and it's a little bit taller on its peak than Jerusalem is. But it's only five miles away. But God chose this little town next to this big town to send his son. And I think the reason is because God was emphasizing little, maybe almost nothing. Bethlehem had very little money. It was not on a major road. It was, I say, a small town compared to Bethlehem, compared to Jerusalem. It had no really any reason for you to choose this except God wanted it to be so. And it was little. But, you know, God wants you to understand that, kind of like we had in the song, which perfectly fit what we're talking about, God has chosen people who have little worth, as far as the world is concerned, to be his people. And God wants you to understand that he can take nothing and make something out of it. And so people might say, well, I'm nothing. I, I, I have anything. God says, good, that's just who I'm looking for. Because I can take that which is very little and make something that is very great. A little boy walked out on the battlefield one day. His name was David. David came with some cheese and other stuff for his brothers who were in the battle. And all of a sudden, this giant steps out. And the giant says, I challenge you to fight me. If you can beat me, then all of us will be your slaves. But if I beat you, then you're all our slaves. Nobody would challenge because he was better than 10, around 10 feet tall. And most Jews are so more like five. What you going to do? He challenged them. He jeered them. He laughed at them for 40 days. What a bunch of cowards. And then, as I say, the boy came, maybe 15, 16, 17 years of age, just a shepherd boy, never had used a sword much or anything like that. He'd never been in the army. He came to bring, as I said, food for his brothers who were in the army, and they also were afraid of that big giant. But when that giant came out, when David came, he said, why don't we go fight him? They said, well, He's so tall and he's so tough and, you know, the edge of his spear is 25 pounds. He's, he's a mighty man. David said, but God can lick him. Yeah, but who's God going to use? Well, isn't it strange that God probably is going to use somebody that isn't much? Not much of a soldier, not much of a fighter, maybe. And David said, I can do that. And so he gathered five rocks and he put them in his little pouch and he had his slingshot and he walked up to take care of that old giant. And the giant laughed at him. Oh, a little boy? To come and fight me? You better go back, sonny. You won't get hurt. David had his staff like he kept for his sheep. And he said, I suppose you're going to beat me like beating a dog or something. And the, the giant thought it was so funny. Until a rock zipped out of, his, out of his hand and hit the giant on the forehead. And the giant toppled down. 
Then David got a hold of his big old sword, and he banged a saw on the head of Goliath and parted the head and the body, and he said, look, Goliath is dead. God used the littlest one on the whole battlefield to conquer. When Jesus came, the Bible says that he emptied himself of all that he had. When he was a baby born in that manger, he looked like all other babies. He didn't shine, didn't have a halo over his head. He looked just like a baby because he came to be what you are, to experience us so that he could help us in our troubles and difficulties. But he had emptied himself of all of his glory in heaven. He came to be nothing. So they can say, well, you know, the reason he is great is because he had rich parents. He didn't. He came from a great city. He didn't. He went to a great university. He didn't. He had lots of clothes. He didn't. He had a great chariot. He didn't. He didn't have anything. He was just a poor person from Nazareth, a despised place beside that, born in Bethlehem, and Jesus became nothing so he could be everything, so the power would be of what? Of God. When David won the battle, who did they praise? Well, they praised God. God was behind that. And then there was Gideon in the Old Testament. God was looking for people he could use, and Gideon was out behind the barn threshing some grain and hiding it because every fall the enemy of the Midianites came over and stole all their grain and they starved almost every every winter time so he was hiding it all of a sudden somebody said good morning Gideon probably scared him out of his boots he said who are you I'm an angel from God and I'm come to tell you something and that is that you are a mighty man and you're going to win a battle he said I, I'm not I am in the smallest family. I am absolutely the smallest in the family. I can do nothing. Oh, he said, God's going to be with you, and you will do a lot of things. And so he said, well, okay, I guess. And he began to do step by step what God wanted him to do. Eventually, God said, now that you kind of trust me, let's get an army together and beat those Midianites back home. Okay. He said, is anybody like to fight on my side? And 22,000, 32,000 joined them. God said, you know, you've got way too many. Why? Well, he said, you can't even count the enemy, and we've got, you know, send them home. And so he said, if you don't really want to go and you're afraid, go home. And so most except for 10,000 went home. God says, you got way, 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 way too many. Too many yet? took him down by the brook and divided them up, and they finally had 300 to fight a, a group you couldn't even number. Now, what's going to happen? How's this going to work out? How, how are these nobodies going to do all of this? Well, God said, I will be with you. And in the middle of the night, God had a plan where they would light their lamps, and they would shout, scare them half to death. They'd run away. They'd kill them, and that's what happened. And the little bit won the battle. You see, God is trying to tell us that we don't have to be someone. We don't have to be great and famous and rich to be his. In fact, it probably works the other way around. God took a little group of nobodies, the 12 apostles, who they laughed at as being Galileans. They don't even speak like most of us do. And they turned the world upside down. God chose little Bethlehem. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says this is the way it has been. It's kind of God's plan to work it out this way, that people will see the plan of God, how it works. They'll say, well, I don't quite understand it, but it is, it is marvelous, and it is because of the power of Almighty God. In chapter 1, he tells us that the gospel is despised by many, many people. He said in verse 22, the Jews, well, they want a sign. And in 21, the Greeks, they want wisdom. And God's given us neither one except a resurrected Christ and a simple plan that says you sin. And you'll be lost because of your sin. But Jesus will save you from your sin. It's kind of that simple, isn't it? We preach Christ, he says, verse 23, crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness. But to us who are called, both Jews and, and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Whatever happened to old Socrates? How many go to Plato's school anymore? Well, those are all gone. Those are great philosophers of the past, but they're just in the past. But Jesus still is triumphant, and Jesus still brings life and hope and strength into people's hearts. But people say it's foolish. You, you believe all that? Yeah, there's reason to believe all that. He said, you see, the foolishness of God, in verse 25, is wiser than men. The weakness of God is stronger than men. 
what would it be like if you don't arm wrestle God? Well, it wouldn't be much of a contest. I mean, he wouldn't have to put very much power on that one. And you try to stand against God like they did in the Bible, like Pharaoh. Well, I'm not going to do what God says. Okay, you get ten plagues. How are you going to stop them? What are you going to do against God? Nothing. God is stronger than men by, by far. So he said, let's take a look at your calling. Verse 26, let's take a look at church. Who, who's all in the church back in Corinth? A very major city, wicked city, somewhat religious city, rich city. Who is there? Well, he said, let's take a look. We see not many wise men. We have some. There have been some great scientists who believe in God. There have been some great people who have been inventors that believe and talk about their faith. There's, we have no doubt about that. But when you think about the average Christian, he's not necessarily a genius. He just figured out that he is lost and needs a Savior. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to do that. Not many mighty. Not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God has chosen the weak things to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of the world and things that are despised, God has chosen them and things that are not to bring to not things that are. You watch how the apostles worked. Lock them in jail, they get out. Tell them they can't and they do. Tell them to quit preach, preaching this gospel and it spreads farther. They can't stop it. And that's what Gamaliel said, if it's of God, we cannot stop it and they could not. Bethlehem was little, chosen as a little city to tell you that God takes the most insignificant of us and he takes the broken of us and he takes those who have no hope and he lifts them up. A lot of places, it's not that way. We have a dear friend that went to a particular group and they told him they didn't want him to come anymore because he had such a disfigured face. He'd been in a fire and his face did look disfigured. But you know who wanted him? Jesus and the Christians, because God chooses people that some of you might discard, and they see the value of what Christ can do and has done, in fact, with that and other people like him. People say, well, they're no good. They're, they're, that's just who Jesus is looking for. When he was on the earth, what did they say? Well, he's such a friend of sinners and publicans. Yeah. A little town of Bethlehem. He's looking for those that don't matter to the world, and he picks them up. I'm glad he does, because I'm one of them. Are you? But secondly about Bethlehem, and that is he chose Bethlehem because it was a royal city. You see, God had a master plan. If you look back in the Old Testament, there's an old man named Jacob. There's Abraham, his son Isaac, his son Jacob. Now Jacob did quite a thing. He had 12, 12 sons, and they became the tribes of Israel. And he, when he was dying, they were grown men and had little children of their own, and he brought them to the bedside, and he sat there, and he talked to each one, what's going to happen? He was like a prophet. Asher, Naphtali, and all the rest. He told what was going to happen to them. And then here came Judah. Judah was child number four of his second best wife. He had two wives, two concubines, however you want to count that, four wives, I guess you'd call it. And so here came Judah. Judah means praise. You see, he had a favorite wife, and he loved her a little bit more than the other wife. He had to marry the first wife because he got tricked, and he didn't know he married her till later in the wedding night because she had a veil, and the father-in-law tricked him and all that. Then he got to marry the wife he really wanted. That was kind of a weird thing. And so poor Leah, the one that he didn't really want, had four children. And the fourth child was called Judah, and Judah means praise to God. She thought her husband would love her because of all the children, but he really didn't. And so when she had the fourth child, she said, well, praise God. I'll just praise God instead. And that was better, I guess. Anyway, he brought Judah and his children there, and he said, Judah, the scepter will never depart from your tribe. You will be the leader of Israel. Your leadership will be forever. Well, that's quite a thing to say way, way back in that time and not knowing how the families are going to go. But God had a master plan, and that was he's going to bring forth his son who is going to be the king of all of us. And he is going to come through this tribe of Judah. And he did that. It reminds me the Bible is true. It reminds me the Bible can be trusted. Because a lot of things happened. You know, Judah was not really a good guy all the time. Uh, it didn't seem like it. Judah had some problems, and, and he got in a little mm, questionable things. If you go back to his 
past, you wouldn't think he'd be much of a king or much of a, a royal person, but God works through the problems that we have. And one day Israel said, we want a king. Everybody else has a king, so we want a king. And God said, okay, Samuel, give him a king. And they got a king by the name of Saul. But here's from Benjamin. What happened to our Judah guy? Well, they jumped the gun. Isn't that funny how we do? We don't trust God sometimes. We don't let God guide our life. We just do something. And they say, oh, I shouldn't have done that. No, you really probably shouldn't have done that. You should have waited for the Lord to lead you. He will guide you, you know, through prayer and other things, the Holy Spirit in your heart. He'll guide you. But they had Saul, and Samuel said, you won't like him after a while. And they didn't because he was oppressive, and, and they hated the fact that he was king. But he was king for 40 years and died on a battlefield. And they said, well, we need a, another king. And Samuel knew who that king was supposed to be. So he ran down to Jesse's house. Jesse had eight children. And the first one was big and strong and tough looking. And, and he said, I think that's our king. And God said, no. I've looked on his heart. You wouldn't want him to be your king. He's rotten in the inside like a tree, you know, that looks good but isn't. Then they went down the next one, and the next one, and the next one. They went through seven of them. All that were standing there, and, and Samuel said, well, isn't there anybody else that you have? You have only seven children. Oh, yeah, Dad said, we've got one more. He's out there keeping the sheep. I don't think you'd be caring about him. It's the older boys you'd like to see, and he, he's small. He's not worth much. It was David. The famous King David was out keeping the sheep, and Samuel said, no, you bring him in. And when he came in, he took the holy oil, which sounds gross, grossome to us, and took the oil and poured it on his head, and it just ran down, oil all over you. But that was anointing. And he now was anointed as the king of Israel. But it was a while before he became full king and in full power. But then David was king of Israel eventually, and God told him, there will always be somebody from your family that will be a king, and eventually the king will come that will be the king of the world. Jesus Christ. And what happened when Jesus was about to be born? Well, the angel appeared to two people. One whose name was Mary, who could trace her family clear back to David, and the other one was Joseph, the dad. He could trace his family clear back to David. Both were from Judah, and the family was completed. God had made his prophecy. It was to be done, and Jesus would come from Judah, and he was. Now, what kind of a king is Jesus? He says, on a throne, bosses you around, collects your taxes. Is that what he is? No. He's the king of your life. He's the king of your heart, king of your soul. That's what God was talking about through the Old of the Old Testament. Jesus was this person who would give you guidance in your life as you should. He has become king. And he will reign, the Bible says, until all enemies have been destroyed. Last enemy he's going to destroy is death, and then heaven, eternally, forever and ever. God had a plan, a master plan. I want people to know that I'm choosing the least to be in my family. Don't have to be smart, don't have to be educated, don't have to be rich, don't have to be something else. I want people that will come to me with an honest and sincere heart. I want them to realize that I had a master plan, and Jesus is the Savior. There's nobody else. You can't follow anybody else. He's the one and only Savior. No one can go to the Father but by Him. But you know, a lot of people have missed the Savior. And they missed the whole plan. They don't understand what God has in mind for some reason. Herod was like that. In the book of Matthew, the Bible tells us that wise men have been traveling a long time. Jesus was in the manger. Everybody else went home. Apparently they, bought a, they rent a house, and now Jesus is in a house. He's a little kid. Could be a maybe two years of age possibly. Finally, the wise men get there. It's slow going on a camel, hundreds of miles, and they get to Jerusalem. That's where you'd choose, wouldn't you? I, I wonder, well, surely in Jerusalem they will know. He stops in at Herod's palace. He said, where is this new king? Well, if there's a new king, it's probably going to be a prince born to the king, right? Well, it wasn't. You know the story. It was born to the poor parents, Mary and and Joseph, and had nothing to do with Herod. Herod wasn't even really a true Jew. And when they heard there was a new king born, 
the whole land was troubled. Herod had killed some of his wives. He'd killed some of his children. Anybody that looked like he might be a, th a threat to him, he'd kill him. And now they hear about a new king of Oh, no, not again. Herod put on his best face and he said, oh. He said, I really don't know, but, uh, but maybe we can find out. And he called the wise men in. He said, you wise men know where the new king is going to be born? And they said, sure. And they read to him what we read at the beginning today. Oh, Bethlehem Ephrathah. You are small among the tribes of Israel, but out of you will come forth he who is from everlasting. It is interesting, you know, what you find in the Bible. That book that kind of sits on the shelf or, or kind of gathers dust. It's interesting what you can get from this for your heart, your soul, your life. Educa oh, I mean, it's a great book. You need to read it. It's a book of life. It's like bread to the soul. And they knew. They knew where he was. They said, well, sure, he's in Bethlehem. He's five miles away. Oh, the king says, I'm so glad to hear that. Why? You go and find him and tell him exactly where he is, then I'll come and worship him. Herod's idea was, I will go and kill him. The wise men didn't know. They didn't know Herod from Adam, so to speak, and they figured that what he told them was right. And so they went down there and they brought their gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, and they're about ready to get on their camels and head back up to tell the king, you've got to come and see this little baby too. And an angel said, don't go back. He wants to harm the baby. And so they went a different way. Well, Herod was waiting and waiting. You know, how, how long does it take to come back? You know, five miles. And finally figured out he got stood up. They're never coming back. Well, you can't, you know, call them or anything back in that day. No communication. So he gathers his army and he moves them down into Bethlehem. And he finds any baby two years or younger, he kills it. I don't know how many he killed, but he killed several. But God also had protected the baby Jesus and told Joseph, move to Egypt. And so he got to Egypt before the babies were killed. It's amazing. God's plan always works. And God gives strength, and he gives comfort, and he gives protection to those who follow him. His master plan, you see how God works and how he works in your life. He wants you to be part of him because he loves you that much. Our song that we've chosen at the end, 112, said that Jesus' name is just above all names. We praise him, particularly this month, for that. 112, join us together as we stand and as we sing this song. 